everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Georgia Ede. I'm so disappointed not to be able to be with you this weekend at Low Carb Denver, but uh, happy to still have the opportunity to share this presentation with you. Um, I speak and write often about the powerful scientific connection between food and mental health, but what happens when you apply those beautiful scientific theories to real life situations, which are often much more complicated? So today I'll be discussing some of the different dietary strategies I use in my practice, some special things you need to be aware of when using ketogenic diets to manage psychiatric conditions, and some stories of people I've worked with who have generously offered to share their experiences with all of you. On the left, you'll see my sources of income. On the right, my unpaid affiliations. So why do I think all psychiatrists should learn about and incorporate nutrition principles into their clinical practice? because the current state of affairs is this. One in six Americans now take at least one psychiatric medication. And yet, depression remains the number one cause of disability. And as you can see here, mental illnesses of all kinds are on the rise around the world. I've been prescribing psychiatric medications for 20 years, and while the results are often disappointing, I've certainly seen them help some people, and sometimes in life-changing ways. However, even when they do work, prescribing medicines can be a frustrating, time-consuming trial and error process, and the price you pay for whatever relief they bring can go beyond co-pays. So notice this list of common side effects. Um, and down at the bottom, you see insulin resistance, um, high insulin levels, high blood sugar levels. Um, the antipsychotic medicines in particular are the ones that can cause insulin resistance and can lead to obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, many other serious chronic diseases over time. So yes, medications can change brain chemistry, but I like to say that the most powerful way to change brain chemistry is through food because that's where brain chemicals come from in the first place. So I think we can and must do better. And to do that, we have to first get curious about what causes mental illness in the first place. And we actually know a lot more about this than we did even 10 years ago. Most psychiatric conditions come with one or more of these common abnormalities listed on the slide. Um, neurotransmitter imbalances in brain chemicals such as serotonin, dopamine, glutamate, nutrient deficiencies in things like B12, iron, zinc, hormonal imbalances, particularly in stress hormone levels, inflammation and oxidative stress, which damage the brain from the inside out, and gut dysfunction, and something called cerebral glucose hypometabolism, which just means sluggish brain glucose processing. Now, some people are making a lot of money targeting some of these problems with expensive supplements and nutraceuticals. But not only do those have a pretty dismal track record overall, but unless you go one level deeper to ask what's causing these abnormalities, you're still not getting to the root of the problem. Now, nutrition is not the only factor, of course, but it just so happens that all of those abnormalities on the previous slide are strongly influenced by diet. Now, a deeper discussion of these is beyond the scope of this presentation, so on my website there are lots of free videos and articles if you're curious to learn more, but the bottom line is that understanding which foods can lead to those abnormalities paves the way for empowering new treatment options. Now, currently, a standard psychiatric evaluation consists mainly of a psychosocial history, symptom checklists, and medication recommendations. Um, in my opinion, a modern psychiatric evaluation should also include a search for reversible root causes of psychiatric symptoms. Perhaps most importantly, I strongly believe that everyone with mental health concerns deserves a metabolic evaluation, because if your brain metabolism is struggling, your brain won't be able to get the energy it needs to function at its best. So then you can take the information gathered during that nutritional and metabolic assessment and use it to discuss and explore exciting new treatment options available to, for people who don't want to take medication or don't respond uh, completely or at all to medication or don't tolerate medication. 
and all that you need is an openness to changing the way you eat. And step one, uh, if you do nothing else, is get the junk out. No matter who you are, old, young, healthy, unhealthy, happy, sad, omnivore, vegan, this common sense advice applies to you whether you're taking medicines or not. Now, some families think that the only person in their household, that only the person in their household with mental health problems is the one who needs to eat healthier and that everyone else can have the luxury of eating junk food whenever they want. But the truth is that nobody should be eating junk food. Um, now, even better, uh, once you've got that down is to go beyond junk free and practice eating a paleo diet. Um, and to, to learn more about what a paleo diet is and why I recommend it for brain health for everyone. Um, I have an article on psychology today called Six Reasons to Go Paleo for Mental Health. Um, but a paleo diet is always my first recommendation for families asking how they can help a child or teenager with mental health problems. And also important to note that uh, for people who choose not to eat animal foods, careful supplementation is critical to avoid nutrient deficiencies. Um, and then uh, if you have insulin resistance, a paleo diet may contain too much carbohydrate in the form of fruits and starchy vegetables to bring your blood glucose and insulin levels into a healthy range. Um, and that's a problem because all of these problems on the left-hand side of the slide, um, psychiatric conditions, have been uh, associated with insulin resistance, high insulin levels, high and poor blood glucose control. So um, if you have insulin resistance, you'll need to go further than paleo often by using targeted metabolic strategies, such as intermittent fasting and low-carbohydrate diets. Uh, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on ketogenic diets because ketogenic diets beautifully lower blood glucose and insulin levels, help stabilize your stress hormone levels and reduce anxiety. They help regulate appetite, energy, mood, concentration, and sleep patterns, getting you off that blood sugar and insulin roller coaster, and they help improve the brain's access to energy. And what I love most about prescribing ketogenic diets is that instead of spending all kinds of time warning people about medication side effects, we get to talk about the side benefits that you can look forward to from ketogenic diets. Uh, instead of high blood pressure, you, you can have normal, you can see normal blood pressure. Instead of gaining weight, you can see healthy weight loss. Instead of brain fog, you can see uh, cognitive clarity. Lots of different benefits um, uh, that uh, help people to stay motivated and, and continue on a new way of eating. But how much do we know about how ketogenic diets affect psychiatric conditions? Well, if we're talking about human studies, uh, human clinical studies, we have precious little to go on. Uh, we have a single paper about two women with a mood condition called bipolar type 2, which is an unstable mood pattern that includes periods of depression alternating with periods of hypomania, which are just uncomfortable highs in mood, who found the ketogenic diet to be superior to lamotrigine, a mood stabilizing medication, and they stopped the medication. We have a brand new paper documenting three cases of binge eating disorder that responded beautifully to a ketogenic diet, bringing binge episodes down from about once or twice a day to essentially zero episodes a day. And we have four papers about people with schizophrenia improving on ketogenic diets, with the most remarkable and best documented case uh, being that of a patient by uh, a patient of Dr. Eric Westman's, who was able to achieve complete resolution of 63 years of auditory and visual hallucinations with a simple low carbohydrate diet. And we have two small pilot studies showing glimmers of hope um, in people with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease uh, who tried a ketogenic diet. And that's it. <laughs> um, so do we need more clinical studies? Yes. And no. Uh, yes, it would be wonderful to have more studies to help convince the skeptical and eventually usher these treatments into mainstream practice. 
and those studies are on the way. But if you're waiting for more convincing science, like large randomized controlled trials comparing keto diets to other diets for your specific mental health condition, you may have to wait a very long time indeed. <clears throat> Fortunately, although most of the information comes from the field of neurology and not psychiatry, we already have a wealth of valuable information about how ketogenic diets improve brain metabolism and overall brain function. Since psychiatric conditions are brain problems too, I think it makes sense to consider how you might begin sooner rather than later to actively apply this important information to your life. My opinion is that the science is already here, the future of psychiatry is already here, it's just the clinical trials that need to catch up. So before we move on, a little about my professional background. I was trained in conventional psychiatry in a Harvard residency program and practiced the way most psychiatrists do, using medications and talk therapy for nearly 10 years before I began incorporating nutrition principles into my practice in 2009. And I practiced in a variety of different uh, health settings. And then in January of 2019, I opened an online consulting practice dedicated exclusively to nutritional psychiatry. And in, in my work, I now help people optimize and troubleshoot their diet of choice from standard and plant-based diets to paleo, autoimmune, low-carb, ketogenic, and elimination diets, including carnivore diets. Now, keep in mind that my practice tends to attract people who are already sold on nutritional approaches, are highly motivated, and have usually already tried lots of medicines and even some diets that haven't worked. Um, so some of the things I've learned in my uh, many years of working with people around nutrition. It's important to be aware that using keto to treat a mental health condition is different in some very important ways uh, than using keto to treat other health conditions such as obesity or type 2 diabetes. For those of you unfamiliar with keto diets, uh, here are some of the most common challenges that uh, pretty much everyone needs to look out for when switching to a keto diet. Um, you have to unlearn decades of misinformation about fat being bad for you and carbs being necessary. You have to avoid temptations. You have to uh, you have to look for support. Uh, you have to deal with social discomfort of eating differently from everybody else or most people. Um, and you may have to deal with uh, some transitional symptoms, uh, of, uh, often called the keto flu, during the first week or two of the diet. And then you have to deal with uh, mounting uh, phenomenon, which I like to call uh, internet keto confusion. Uh, so many mixed messages about net carbs, total carbs, protein fat ratios, grass fed versus conventional uh, meat, MCT oil, buttered coffee, fat bomb recipes, fasting windows, collagen powder. It goes on and on. Uh, these are just some of the common questions I get from people that make keto diets unnecessarily complicated. But then, in addition to all of that, people uh, who are trying to use ketogenic diets for mental health conditions have an additional set of challenges to face. Um, for uh, it, It's, of course, uh, uh, harder and slower to use a diet than it is to take a medication, because it can take a while for the diet to start working. Um, there are far fewer resources and knowledgeable professionals in this field. Um, people who tend towards perfectionism or OCD type thinking can take any dietary strategy to an extreme, including ketogenic diets and sometimes to dangerous extremes. There are some psychiatric medications which work against ketosis, make it harder to get into ketosis and lower your insulin levels. There are people with trauma histories who have very complicated attachments to food. And then, of course, the conditions themselves, like depression and anxiety, can work against you. So, for example, people with depression are already um, dealing with low motivation and energy levels, and the you know, thought of changing the diet can seem overwhelming. And people with anxiety can worry too much about the transition phase or about ketone levels um, and uh, any dietary changes. So, and, and then what I see a lot is, you know, that difficulty adhering to the diet, which, which all of us face, um, can cause guilt, shame, feelings of failure, and when people are feeling that way, their self-esteem can plummet and they can feel embarrassed and that can often lead to them canceling appointments or not showing 
uh, when they've strayed from the diet. So, um, but it, but if you are uh, interested in, uh, if you're a clinician or or uh, somebody with symptoms looking uh, to a ketogenic diet, it's important to to pause before you. If you if you're really excited about it, just take a pause before you decide to try it and 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 learn some things about about uh, the diet. So while a ketogenic diet is safe for most people, there are exceptions. So for example, it can be dangerous to use a ketogenic diet under the circumstances listed at the top of this slide. And then there are other health conditions such as type 1 diabetes, um, where you need to plan more carefully and consult with other specialists. Um, but if a ketogenic diet seems appropriate to try, um, have some thoughtful discussions first with the people you're working with and, and plan ahead. And it may take several sessions with a psychiatrist, nurse practitioner, therapist, or nutrition specialist to really think through um, and get ready for this kind of a change in your life. And one of the things to prepare for is the transition to keto, which can be rocky for everyone, but can be especially rocky sometimes for people with mental health conditions. Low carbohydrate diets cause profound shifts in brain and body chemistry, uh, very healthy shifts, but they happen rather quickly and this can temporarily affect mood and medication levels. So things may get worse for just a little while before they get better. In addition to the usual keto flu symptoms that people sometimes experience like headaches or cravings, you can sometimes see periods of high anxiety, even manic symptoms, mood swings or worsen depression. Now, a lot of people consult with me saying that their depression got worse on a keto diet. And in most cases, it's because they didn't try it for long enough. They tried for maybe a few days or a couple of weeks, or they weren't actually in ketosis. They weren't measuring ketones um, and actually getting into ketosis. So you may not have a sense for how the diet will work for you until you've reached that um, sort of magical four to six week mark, which is a an important reflection point um, that I see in a lot of people. Um, so before embarking on a keto diet, you have to chart your course and, and, and prepare and plan. You pre-schedule appointments, uh, find your sources of support, make your food plan, decide what you're going to measure and how often and why, and think through the medications and any physical health problems that may need monitoring, particularly during the first couple of months. If you're using the ketogenic diet to treat serious psychiatric symptoms, those symptoms could return very quickly if you stop the diet. So you'll need to plan for how to cope with any worsening of symptoms that might happen if you stray from the diet along the way. Um, but the biggest obstacle of all in my experience, and it's a biggie, is food addiction which is just as real as addiction to substances like alcohol, cigarettes, or drugs, but may be actually worse in a lot of cases because your body can do without substances, but you can't stop eating for the rest of your life. You have to eat every day, and you have to make good food choices every single time you eat. And making those good choices is really difficult. Um, scientific studies suggest that sugar can be more addictive than cocaine. But food addiction isn't always just about carbohydrates. It can be about anything you can't stop eating. Uh, this is why keto doesn't free everyone from food obsession and doesn't easily help everyone achieve a healthy weight. A lot of people who like to call themselves foodies are often food addicts and may be drawn to low carbohydrate diets because of the belief that you can eat as much food as you want and not gain weight or be unhealthy. But unfortunately, this is not true for everyone. And some popular keto foods can be abused and overeaten, um, leading to uh, not just weight gain plateaus in some cases, but even sometimes to weight gain. So remember, just because it may be marketed as keto friendly doesn't necessarily mean it's keto or friendly. So a few uh, clinical pearls that I've learned along the way the importance of the human relationship between the clinician and the client. Um, really important respect, trust, uh, non-judgmental uh, um, uh, relationship, 
and really emphasize curiosity, learning, and discovery rather than, you know, being good or bad or uh, uh, following the diet or not following the diet. Practice, not perfection. Um, acknowledge, uh, look for signs of food addiction. Um, uh, talk about how hard it is to give up sugar and other carbohydrates. Don't make it sound like it's easy. For many people, it's very difficult. And for people with a significant food addiction history, they may need some guardrails, some limits placed um, on on their diet beyond simply counting carbohydrates in terms of um, how much to eat and, and how often. Um, electrolyte supplementation is just as important for keto for mental health as it is for any other uh, keto diet situation. I rarely but do some, sometimes use MCT oil or exogenous ketones during that transition period if people are really struggling with certain symptoms or are having a hard time getting into ketosis because of a medication they're taking. I try not to use them, um, but they can sometimes help in a pinch. And then uh, when it comes to medications, take a look at that entire medication list, not just the psychiatric medications, and look for medicines that can work against ketosis, that can raise blood sugar or insulin levels, and reduce, remove, or replace them if you can. Um, and, and really important to mention this, um, stay open to psychiatric medications as either a temporary, like short term part of the plan for getting through that initial phase. Um, I, I don't do that very often, but every once in a while. Um, and, and even long term, some people who come to me have no interest in getting off their psychiatric medications. They just want to feel better, um, and then they do, uh, already. So, um, some more specific medication management pearls. I have an article, a very much more detailed article called Psycho in Psychology Today called Ketogenic Diets and Psychiatric Medications, where you can learn more. But just a few interesting tidbits. Um, uh, valproic acid or Depakote is actually a fatty acid. So that can be burned at higher rates on keto diets and can change levels. Lithium is a salt. And when you switch to a ketogenic diet, that can change the way your body processes uh, uh, water and electrolytes. So you keep an eye on the lithium level. Um, antipsychotics, as we mentioned before, induce insulin resistance, so they can make it harder to get into ketosis, uh, etc. So this is really the mother of all questions about low-carb diets. How low do your carbs need to go, and do ketones matter? Now, simple low carb can lower and stabilize blood sugar, but may not lower insulin levels enough to generate ketones and provide meaningful benefits for certain conditions. Um, so one, one common point of keto confusion is about whether a medical, so-called medical ketogenic diet is required for psychiatric disorders. These are the, the very deep, the, the, uh, getting into very deep ketosis with a very high fat to protein ratios, very high fat, lower in protein. And it's really hard to achieve those ratios and get those very high ketone levels um, with a, a simple whole foods diet. So these diets are difficult to manage without expert assistance. Um, so in my experience, I haven't found it necessary to go to that extreme to see benefits. Um, so I think it's always worth it to try a whole foods moderate ketosis approach first before exploring stricter options. So just a few uh, stories to share with you. I'm really privileged um, to uh, enjoy working with and learning every day from my patients, um, many of whom have generously offered to share their stories. Um, given the stigma that comes along with mental health conditions, um, they're not sharing their names or identities. Um, but uh, I think their stories are really powerful. So I've chosen just a few today to give you a sense of the variety of different approaches that can be helpful. So um, this first story is that of a 15-year-old high school student who uh, was suffering with uh, uh, significant symptoms of depression with psychotic features. And those symptoms included things like not going to school and uh, some paranoid thinking, even some self-injury and a suicide attempt. Uh, he was, over time, hospitalized th on three separate occasions and eventually um, was uh, 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 discharged on an antipsychotic medication, quetiapine, also known as Seroquel, and fluoxetine, an antidepressant medication, also known as Prozac. 
the diet that he was eating when he was going through all of this um, was not uncommon for your typical teenager. Lots of processed foods, sugary foods, fast foods, um, chips, cokes, ice cream, etc. So um, talking with the mom, um, we, we talked about what I usually do as a starting point with any young person is to start practicing paleo. And so he is now at the point um, uh, where he's eating paleo uh, with dairy. That was a modification made because he loves dairy <laughs> um, uh, about 60% of the time. And that's a huge change for a 15 year old. Um, and, and, and the result is that he's doing quite a bit better. He's calmer, he's more engaged, more agreeable, attending school far more often. Um, the paranoia has gone down, the anger is vastly improved, less moody, etc. No more suicidal thinking. And as a side benefit, the scarring acne he's dealt with for a long time is, is starting to heal up. He is off of both of those medications. Um, this is a quote from his mom. Um, my son is alive again. He's more animated, laughs more, tells more stories, seems interested in life. He is not perfect, nor do I think I cured him, but I can't deny the changes in diet and the removal of antipsychotic meds have produced a much healthier child. Now, this case is an example of how simply practicing better dietary quality can make a big difference. It doesn't mean it's easy. Teenagers especially are tough. But this amazing mom has worked really hard to help her son change how he eats. And she has to walk a fine line because she understands she has to give him some freedom and flexibility or else risk, you know, um, resentment and rebellion. Um, this next story is um, of a 31-year-old um, uh, woman with panic attacks, emotional eating. Um, these were her symptoms that she came to me with. Um, a lot of this um, uh, she felt were symptoms of hypoglycemia, um, panic attacks, feeling hungry all the time, sleepy after meals, craving sweets, etc. She wasn't taking any medications and she did not want to take any medication. She wanted a natural approach. So um, this was the diet that she was eating when she first came in. Um, and as you can see, it doesn't look that bad, especially when you compare it to uh, the diet we were just looking at uh, in our last uh, in our last story. Um, but uh, clearly it was a problematic diet for her. Um, so uh, it may seem counterintuitive to ask someone worried about low blood sugar to take the sugar out of the diet, but it actually works like a charm. So this was what she reported eating after she changed her diet, primarily whole foods, um, and including animal foods and with their natural fats. Um, still no medication, and this is what she reported after changing to that diet, that she um, was able to achieve about 90% relief from those um, uh, symptoms which were really disrupting her life. Now, she wasn't measuring ketones. She was just focusing on whole foods and avoiding carbohydrates. So how often do you see 90% relief with medications and without side effects? Um, this next story, this is a terrific, brilliant, talented guy who has lived with severe depression since the age of 11 and has been plagued with thoughts of suicide for the past few years. Um, uh, uh, suicidal thinking, anxiety, brain fog, fatigue. And um, he has, has conquered a number of addictions. He's, uh, to his great credit, 27 years sober, um, also stopped smoking a long time ago, um, but continues to struggle with food and Diet Coke addiction. Now, for a long time, he um, had great success with a 12-step uh, food uh, addiction program that removed sugar and wheat and required measuring and weighing of food and sponsors and so forth. And that worked really well for him for 10 years. Um, so when he we first got in touch, he was taking Lamotrigine, which is a mood-stabilizing antidepressant, and trazodone, which uh, is an old-fashioned antidepressant that's used uh, for sleep. Um, his uh, The diet that he came to me on was a standard diet high in processed foods. His new diet uh, we decided to try is a ketogenic diet. Um, and when he is in ketosis, he notes that he flourishes. His suicidal thoughts go away. His life feels worth living. 
He's more hopeful, more creative, and, and he has a lot more energy and, and more mental clarity than he did on the 12 step program that had helped him a while back. And we haven't changed anything about the medications, but, um, you know, it's been challenging for him, um, uh, getting into and staying in ketosis because primarily of the food addiction piece, um, and the approximately gallon of Diet Coke that he drinks every day. So, and when he goes in and out of ketosis, if he hasn't gotten to that four to six week mark, um, he can really get some rapid cycling of mood, some anxiety, some crying spells, and deep depressions until he gets past that threshold. So uh, what he says, among the many things he said to me, um, it's astonishing. He couldn't get out of bed for two years, and now some days are so good. Never had access to this before. I can pay attention to hours of careful conversation mm -hmm. at work. It's the most helpful treatment he's encountered so far for mental health. So his quality of life is dramatically better when he adheres to a keto diet. But despite having conquered alcohol and nicotine addiction, he is really struggling to avoid carbohydrates long term. And uh, this final case I'll share with you, just a wonderful woman with a, a great sense of humor who has um, lived with severe depression since the age of 15 and lots of other symptoms along with it. Um, uh, suicidal thinking, premenstrual mood symptoms lasting a couple of weeks, panic attacks, chronic pain, poor sleep quality. And um, she was originally taking uh, bupropion XL, also known as Wellbutrin, and lamotrigine, also known as lamictal, uh, for her mood disorder. Um, originally, she was on, uh, for many years, a gluten-free, dairy-free, whole foods diet. Uh, that didn't help her much with her, um, with her depression. So then, um, uh, and this is before she started working with me, she embarked on a ketogenic diet, and she followed the ketogenic diet for 18 months. And she kept her ketone levels in a good range. Uh, she didn't check very often, but when she checked, they were good. Um, and, you know, she lost 20 pounds, but plateaued at 217. And this diet helped ease her depression, uh, sort of smooth and soften the, the waves of depression. But it, it eventually came back and her suicidal thoughts returned. And she was in a very, very severe depression, um, uh, at a certain point, um, and her treaters recommended IV ketamine infusions. So we started working together, and she decided she'd like to try a carnivore diet. Um, and, and she's now been on that diet for a little over seven weeks now. Um, and she's just noticed just incredible <clears throat> changes. Uh, her premenstrual symptoms have been greatly reduced. The panic attacks are completely gone. The body aches gone for the first time deep quality sleep, better concentration, and she broke that long weight loss plateau and has already lost 16 more pounds. And very, very interesting to both of us is that uh, she was she was getting her ketamine treatments every two months, and she would notice her mood dipping uh, at about the five-week mark. So she would always kind of hang on until that, that uh, week number eight when she could get another ketamine treatment, and by that time she was usually feeling pretty badly. But this last cycle, she she actually forgot, pretty much forgot about the ketamine treatment. She didn't need it at all. Her mood did not sink during this last two-month cycle. So that was um, really interesting to both of us. Um, and what she says is that her mood is now mostly kind of neutral, with a few points of actually feeling good. Um, and she just couldn't remember the last time that it happened. It had been years. And she says that this, you know, is a hundred times better than any medication she's ever taken. So it's only been seven weeks or so, and, you know, more time and more adjustments may need to be made to see if more progress is possible, but we are both thrilled with her progress so far. So if you need specialized help um, for your mental health condition, this is a list of the psychiatrists that I happen to be aware of who use ketogenic diets and intermittent fasting in their clinical work. Uh, we need, obviously, many more. Um, I, so I now offer individual and group trainings for fellow clinicians and mental health clinics through my consult service, and I'm actively exploring creative new ways to improve access to information and guidance for the general public as well that goes beyond one-on-one -on -one sessions. So stay tuned for more on that. 
Um, but if you don't have a serious mental or physical illness and you're not taking any medications, but you're struggling with depression or anxiety or ADD or what have you, it may be safe to try a ketogenic diet without the help of a specially trained psychiatrist. But please educate yourself first before deciding how to proceed. Uh, on my website, I have a, a, a list of resources, including links to my comprehensive guide to low-carb diets for mental health, which was published on the Diet Doctor site, um, which Dr. Andreas Anfeld has generously made available free for everyone to access without a membership fee. So there's a link to that on my website as well as uh, to many other resources. So really in, in closing, I just want to say that, you know, worldwide, there are skyrocketing rates of mental illness and serious shortages of psychiatrists of all kinds. But what if everyone fed their brains properly? Would most people feel better and need less psychiatric medication? Could eating a healthy diet from the time of conception, the very beginning of our lives, prevent or reduce the incidence of certain psychiatric conditions in the first place? That's the world I envision and work towards every day. So thank you for listening, and I hope this presentation has helped you or a loved one to consider new possibilities.